position. We're neighbors. You have to be nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have to be nice to him because he's the president of the HOA. <laughs> but he's been in ER position for how many years? Uh, this is coming up at the end of 12. 12 years. Right now he's the medical director at St. Shawnee. So we have a rotation out there, but it's just like urgent care, I guess. Yeah. So. I think some, uh, <laughs> some of the primary care will take some. Yeah. Well, you might run into it. Shawnee on the phone with some time, but I'll turn it over to him, and our TVs are on. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. No, this is more fun, though. Here's yeah. a stick. Here's the ghost stick. It's on. It's on. You guys missed the quiz. <laughs> <laughs> uh, zero, zero. <laughs> Minute late. All right, good morning, guys. Um, I'm AC Hughes. Um, please feel free to raise your hand and um, you know, make it as informative as possible. My goal is to kind of come from the angle of an emergency department uh, physician of how I approach a patient with abdominal pain, okay? To discuss the things. I think of, okay, I and mean, my job is, is, is to decide whether or not you need to be in the hospital, whether or not you need surgery, whether or not you're going to die, okay. Um, my job is not to work up the zebras, okay. I don't I care about that. It's not my job to di diagnose your celiac disease, your pheochromocytoma, um, porphyr porphyry container tarda, I and mean, those things are things that I don't work up. When you come to me, uh, you're acutely sick. And it's, it's my job is, you know, the emergency department is a triage to the hospital. Do you go home, do you get admitted, or do you need surgery? So, so those are my goals. So the things I'm going to discuss are kind of the things that I think about and the way I approach a patient when they come to the emergency department. Okay? So if you guys have any questions as we go through, please my children. Okay. Um, <laughs> these, uh, so I'm an I'm a Oklahoma, I guess I can see it here. The, uh, I'm an Oklahoma boy. I grew up in Ponca City, so I've been here all my life. Uh, I went to OU as an undergrad. Um, went to OSU's medical school. These are my boys, and then my dog, and then my cat. So you can tell which kid is crazy. Right. So I said, hey, you know, you guys sit down. And pose. We, we had the boat for about five years. I said, we got to get a name. So the boy picked Kevin. <laughs> Fortunately, the dog was a rescue dog, and it already had the name Charlotte, so they did not get the name in. So, the cat, they got the name, and it was named Gary. <laughs> you watch Spongebob, there's a snail, and the snail named Gary, and what does Gary say? Yeah. yeah. So, so we, we got Gary. So, Gary is actually more of a dog than the dog, so it only drinks out of a faucet. Um, it's very high maintenance. So at 4.30 in the morning when I wake up to go to work, the cat is sitting on the bathtub ready to have a drink. So I'll sit there and meow until, until I turn the faucet on. So this is uh, my current home, uh, St. Anthony Shawnee. If everybody uh, doesn't know where Shawnee is, it's about 30 miles east of the city. Um, I live in Oklahoma City, drive back and forth. I've been out there for three and a half years. Small little community hospital, right? So. Uh, Small communities got OBU there. So we saw 50,000 patients last year. So it's a uh, busy facility. I um, hire, I have 10 full-time physicians, have four full-time mid-levels, a mixture of PAs and nurse practitioners, um, with about four or five part-time uh, mid-levels. We staff 44 hours of uh, physicians a day and 24 hours of mid-level. So. Um, I work for a company, How It Works, so I work at St. Anthony Shawnee. How Mercy Farmers works is they usually contract with a company, so I actually work for Team Health. Um, Team Health runs about 2,000 emergency departments across the country. Um, they pretty much run every emergency department except for Baptist and Mercy here in the, in the city. Uh, we have some in Tulsa, uh, Stillwater, so we're kind of all over the state. Um, you guys are becoming incredibly valuable in medicine. Um, you guys are coming out at a good time in your training. 
the uh, team health <coughs> excuse me, states that we're hiring uh, mid-levels, when I say mid-levels, I include nurse practitioners and PAs, um, faster than we're hiring physicians, okay? So team health saw millions of patients across the, uh, across the United States last year, 40% were seen by mid-levels. So you guys are becoming incredibly value, uh, valuable in emergency departments and emergency medicine, so um, it, it's, it's a really good time and <clears throat> ER, if you want to do that, there's plenty of opportunity. So obviously this gentleman has abdominal pain. Okay. They don't always present like this though, and this is not what we're going to discuss. Traumatic abdominal pain is, is a total different topic. Um, it's a whole different lecture and everything, but obviously, you know, he's going to have some pain and he's going to have some issues. Um, so shockingly, he must be somewhat stable. He's not innovated, um, but of course, like I said, they don't always present like that. All right, he's he's got some. He's going to have some trauma. So, so I put a chest X-ray up. Okay, so so <clears throat> this is a kind of reminder to to think that not all complaints you know, uh, are, you know, what they seem. Someone comes in and says, golly, um, my, my lower chest hurts right here. And you get a chest x-ray to focus on, well, their chest is hurting, but there's something abnormal about this, um, and the patient is not wearing booby tassels. You know? <laughs> Let's see if that works. We're not, that's not the abnormality. Um, uh -huh. Oh, the tornado won't work. Will it might work? not be on. It won't. There we go. Right. Yeah. Oh, you got to get the How does that work? It doesn't work on the stand. No. What's wrong with TVs? Okay. <laughs> so I don't know how many chest x-rays you guys have looked at. So um, I highly encourage you guys to, to look. You're responsible for the test you order. So you guys, in your training, look as many x-rays as you can. Um, so this patient comes in and says, ah, oh, my lower chest hurts. But, so I use kind of the ABCDs of looking at a chest x-ray. And, and the other thing about when you look at x-rays, and going off on a tangent here, is do the same thing every time. If it's a foot, if it's an ankle, if it's a chest, okay? So you want to ABCD. Your airway, okay, is the airway midline? It is. Nothing really exciting there. That could put you towards an indication of a pneumothorax or something. Be the bones. You're responsible for everything in the x-ray, okay? So if the bones are on the x-ray, you're responsible for it. If the patient fall and they have a humerus fracture. So you can kind of see they're, they capture the humeruses, they capture the scapulas, and I don't really see anything there. See, um, cardiac. So the cardiac silhouette. Do they have cardiomegaly? Okay, is there uh, air around the heart? Do they have a pneumomediastinum? Um, different things like that. And again, this is just how I look at an x-ray. All right, and then D is diaphragm. And so that's where the abnormality is here. So you look at the diaphragms, okay? This patient has free air. So they've got a perforation. And this x-ray is pretty good, if you can see it on your monitor, you can actually see the gastric bubble. So here's the gastric bubble. You'll see air a lot, but it's typically separated. So right here, this air is the stomach. This air right up against the diaphragm should not be there. We should not have air in our abdomen. So they've got a perforation, whether it's from a, uh, an ulcer or uh, diverticulitis. So, so that patient, chest pain actually came from their stomach. Okay, so goals today. We're going to discuss the differences of kind of pain patterns. Bristle, bristle, visceral, and I can talk, versus parietal or somatic. Um, go through the approach to the patient, okay? History and physical, these are so important, okay? Your tests you order are to confirm your diagnosis. So when you see a patient and you leave the room, I already know, I think this patient has a kidney stone. I think this patient has gallbladder disease. I don't walk out and go, I have no idea, let's just order some tests, okay? <laughs> If you're doing that, you need to go back in, you need to ask more questions, you need to do a better exam. The, um, and it's, it's a dying art because we have CAT scans, okay? But when you approach a patient that way, I'm just going to order the test to confirm what I already know, it's much easier. And you'll be much faster, you'll be much more efficient, okay? Important physical findings. And then the common ED 
uh, causes of abdominal pain. So I'm going to kind of, we'll go through the differential diagnosis, how we narrow it down, um, testing, and kind of final diagnosis. And when we go through the specific causes, it's, you know, we're going to kind of just touch them real generally. I'm not going to go into um, how to remove an appendix, okay? That's a surgeon's job. I make the diagnosis, <coughs> pass the baton on to them. So abdominal pain, 10% of all ED complaints. So really, um, I would say it's more 20%, okay? That number I got from a text that's, you know, probably eight years old. Um, but really, I would say it's 20%. So on average, I see um, in my emergency department 130 patients a day. So you're talking 20 to 30 patients that come and complain of abdominal pain. So this is, I mean, bread and butter. You're going to do this every day. You need to be able to distinguish between benign and life-threatening, right? The knife in the belly is life-threatening, okay? So early intervention, getting surgery on board, um, you know, that patient's going to be admitted, right? When a patient comes to the emergency department, I have to say, you're not sick, you're going home, um, you're being admitted, you need surgery. So that's what I want to decide um, for the patient. One of the most difficult things I see for new grads, okay, PAs especially, you guys, I went through four years of on-the-job training as a residency. You guys, I'd be scared as hell. <laughs> it's difficult though. You guys want to find a diagnosis. And sometimes people come in the emergency department and say, I have abdominal pain. I do a workup, I do a CAT scan, it's normal. I say, well, you have abdominal pain. <laughs> well, what is it? It's abdominal pain. 30 to 40 percent. So, out of all the people that come in the emergency department, like I said, 30, uh, 30 patients a day, you know, 12 to 15 are going to have, you have abdominal pain. It's okay to not find a diagnosis. And it's, I think that's one of the hardest things when you guys first get out is to, you want to find that answer. And sometimes there's not an answer. Sometimes our small bowels cramp. Sometimes, um, you know, the muscles cramp. You can't see that on your testing. There's no blood test to tell me that. You've got indigestion, you know. So, um, you've got to get comfortable with that. And that comes with time, okay. As you mature, as you see thousands of patients, you walk in the room and um, there's kind of certain flags. When a patient has their legs crossed and is too busy texting on their phone to look up, Pretty indication I'm ready for your discharge paperwork. So, okay. So we're going to talk kind of in on the slides here: visceral and uh, parietal pain. Um, the the third kind is also kind of referred pain, is is what the textbook will talk about. So when you think about these, it kind of helps kind of delineate pain patterns and things, and help you again narrowing down your diagnosis because that's what we want to do. So visceral pain is more from kind of the stretching of an organ, um, the capillary stretching of a solid organ. This will usually start first as you get some dilation. So the example here is mesenteric ischemia, but like a classic example is early appendicitis. So early appendicitis, you get an initial dilation of the appendix from some type of obstruction, lymphoid hyperplasia, or a appendicolith, and so they get stretching. So this is the early stages of appendicitis. And they come in and they go, oh, my belly button kind of hurts. Okay, so it's kind of crampy. I've got a pain there, not very nonspecific. A bowel obstruction. They get dilation of the small bowel. I just kind of hurt everywhere because that bowel is stretching. So it's a more a visceral pain, okay, and it's related to the innervation of the nerves that serve those organs in the visceral um, uh, thorough. So um, it's kind of intermittent, dull, crampy, poorly localized, so it's a more generalized, you know, early appendicitis, they're going to, ah, my stomach kind of hurts. Um, another example is mesenteric ischemia. Parietal pain, okay, so this is your more specific, okay, this is when you start getting <coughs> dead tissue or specific inflammation, okay, again, the example of appendicitis, you get some dilation of the appendix, it gets enlarged, so when you get a CAT scan, the... Um, Typical appendix is less than nine millimeters. So on that, you'll see an enlargement of the appendix, and then there's inflammation around it. So when you start getting the inflammation, they start going, oh, it hurts right here, okay? And there's inflammation of the 
mesentery around the appendix, so it hurts to move, it's sharp. Um, so it's more specific. Uh, so ischemia, inflammatory, stretching of the parietal peritoneum in this phase. It's more specific, sharp, constant, um, and you'll get your rebounding guarding in your more specific exam on this. Questions or anything there? So history, so you walk into the room, again, you should be able to make your diagnosis almost from your history. Okay, that's going to lead you, again, kind of to your physical exam, so it's, it's every patient. You walk in, you get a history, um, you do your physical, they kind of confirm what you're thinking, but when you're, when you're talking to them, you should have an idea, right? If someone comes in and says, my ankle hurts, I'm not worried about their appendix, okay? So you want to get that history, you want to know where their pain is. So onset, so when did this start, okay? I've had this pain for three months. A little less concerning in the emergency department. You probably need to see your primary care physician. Um, it started 15 minutes ago. It started suddenly, okay? I was sitting there watching a uh, movie and I got 10 out of 10 pain here, okay? That indicates more like a kidney stone, okay? An abrupt onset. But certain diseases are gonna have certain patterns. Gradual. I started noticing some pain yesterday when I woke up. Kind of all day here, I was nauseous. Been going on for about a day, two, had some fever, and now it's just, it's just sitting right here, okay? So appendicitis is more of a gradual onset. Um, gallbladder disease or gallbladder pain would be more of a sudden onset. So that's important, you know, how did this start? Um, when did it start? Did you wake up with it? Did it start last night? You were able to sleep? Did it come and go? Location, okay, again, this kind of goes back to visceral to somatic, but we'll discuss what I like to think more of, and you'll see the slide, um, we'll have it broken down into kind of nine quadrants, but really the location, I like to think of, you, you divide the abdomen into two to four quadrants, right down the middle, right across the belly button. So you got right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, left lower quadrant, okay? And then you form your differential diagnosis based on anatomy. Duration, has it been hours to days? Character, okay, is it sharp, dull, cramping, stabbing? Um, have you had fevers, throwing up, diarrhea, constipation? Does it hurt to pee? Is there blood in your urine? Um, all those symptoms that go along with it. Does it shoot anywhere, okay? Pancreatitis will classically go straight to the back. Uh, I got pain right here, my back's hurting. Um, a kidney stone, flank pain, shoots down to my right inguinal region, to my privates. Um, aortic aneurysm, abdominal pain, straight through to my back. Um, is there any precipitating or alleviating factors? Okay, when you eat, does it get worse or does it get better? Okay, when you throw up, is it better or is it worse? If you move around, does it make it worse? Um, and then severity, you know, obviously, you know, a one to 10 scale. This discusses pain out of proportion, which um, we'll kind of get to that with mesenteric ischemia of an exam that doesn't meet the patient's pain. Um, and that's a concerning thing. Physical exam, okay. Vital signs, vital signs, vital signs, okay. I, I cannot stress this enough. This is pounded into my head for four years of training. This will hang you out. Address the vital signs, okay. Medical legally, an attorney, it, it's a hard number in the chart. You have to address the vital signs. Vital signs are crucial, okay. If you have a patient with a heart rate of 120, normal heart rate 60 to 100, okay, you need to address that. Because if something bad happens to that patient, that attorney's going to go, did you not see they had a heart rate of 120? Was that not important to you? Were they not sick? For some reason, they were tachycardic. Were they septic? Um, were they volume depleted? Were they anemic? So you have to address that. Um, blood pressure, temperature, okay? Address the vital signs, it's critical. General appearance, when you enter the room, they have their legs crossed, they are got their Cheetos and their Route 44, and what's that? The, my favorite is, hold on. Mm. I'll be back when you're ready. So, okay, are they laying still on the bed? Are they pale? Are they diaphoretic? Okay, 
One thing with pain, you can't fake diaphoresis. Okay? Someone that's faking this, I have 10 out of 10 pain, right? You ask them pain, it's subjective, right? They get to give you a number. I'm in 10 out of 10. I always say that, you know, when new PAs come in, they go, they say they're paying this 10 out of 10. I said, well, sure, so is mine on my small toe, but I'm doing okay. <laughs> you know, because it's easy. It's, it's, it's a, I always say, give me your pain scale 1 to 10. 10 if your body's on fire. And these people are sitting there like, it's probably a 9. I'm like, what? <laughs> Two, you must be floating. I mean, what? what's going on? Um, but you can't fake sweating, okay? Someone, off the subject here, chest pain, and they're diaphoretic, it's, it's for real, okay? Abdominal pain, they're pale, they're rolling around sweating, something's going on. You cannot fake sweating. Make yourself sweat right now. <laughs> I'm trying. No. Okay. So, are they distressed? Are they rolling around? Or are they um, laying still? Okay, that's an indication. We're not going to discuss kidney stones. You guys will have a section of that. But you walk into a room and someone's going, I'm dying. I am dying. I'm dying. Okay, that's a kidney stone. Someone that has a, um, a ruptured uh, bowel or something that has peritonitis, they don't want to move. A child with appendicitis, they're going to lay still as, you know, ever. They're not going to run from you or anything. They'll just lay there, okay? Because it hurts to move, okay? So it gives you an indication of things. So when you look at them, you, okay, you want to look, listen, and feel, right? So look, have the patient lay supine, expose their abdomen, okay? Look at it. Is it distended? Is it discolored? Is there icterus? Are they jaundiced? Okay, is there a big kaput medusa because they've got cirrhosis? Um, is there any bruising? Okay, flank bruising, perimbilical bruising, um, bowel sounds. Valuable, oh, a small bowel obstruction, classic L high pitched tinkling bowel sound. Really, the literature says that they're not, it's not that valuable. Do I listen? 100% of the time. Okay. You look, listen, and feel. That's how you examine an abdomen. 100% of the time, with that, I listen to bowel sounds, but I also palpate because they're kind of distracted. They think you're, they think you're listening, but I do a little because again, like my pain's 10 out of 10. Oh, hey, oh, don't do, do that. It's very easy for patients to do that. So if you can kind of distract them and not know, you know, you start listening to them, listen to all four quadrants. They kind of think you're listening, but you're actually palpating. And then palpation. You guys have kind of had clinical classes and stuff. So if I tell you I've got right upper quadrant, okay, you want to lay the patient. i got right upper quadrant pain. You want to lay the patient, patient flat. I examine the abdomen, three fingers, okay, one hand on the other. You want to start away from the pain. So start in the left lower quadrant, okay, here, and here, and here, and examine. Okay, you get the right upper quadrant here. Because sometimes it's difficult. We'll say, I hurt right here. And you're like, dang it. That's like, even with the belly button. Is it low or is it high? So then I'll localize to the side and say, okay, I'm going to place, my, I'm going to push on three spots. I don't want you to re respond at all. Palpate here, here, and here. And I'll say, okay, this is one, this is two, this is three. Where's the worst? Where's the worst pain? Because again, right, my whole goal is to get a differential diagnosis. And I'm going to order a test to confirm what I think. So you want to try to best identify the location. And then obviously when you're palpating, okay, is it a rigid abdomen? Okay, do they have um, you know, peritoneal signs? Is it big and distended? Uh, do they have hepatomegaly? Uh, can you palpate their liver? Um, so that's kind of your examination. So specific things, rebound guarding, okay? So rebound, okay, someone with appendicitis, you push it on their stomach and then you let go, and the thought oh, hurts, okay, rebound pain. Another chick, uh, tr tr trick with kids is you have them get up and walk around the room, say, hey, jump up and down. I, I do it 100% of the time. A kid with appendicitis will not jump up and down. He's going to get over, he's going to walk and look at you. And go, no, I'm not. <laughs> okay. So guarding. Okay, so when you palpate the abdomen, they, they reflexively guard. Now, you're going to have these guys with six packs and they're all ripped up and 
you go to examine their abdomen and they're, they're sitting there. <laughs> 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 okay. And so you're like pushing, you're like, I can't tell this is hard. The guy's got a six pack, I don't know. So um, you say, hey, put your head back, relax. Again, try to distract them with something. Hey, man, what do you do? What do you do? And they'll eventually will relax and you can palpate. Um, against people with that, um, people that, you know, when you're, when you're looking for guarding people, you, when they know you're examining them, oh, 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 you kind of try to distract them or something. Um, you know, I will discuss with the family or ask another question and I'll keep palpating the abdomen and you'll get no response. Children kind of do the same thing. They're, they're upset, they're sitting on mom's lap, they're crying, you push on their stomach and they're real tender and everything, you get them kind of calmed down, you give them a foyer or something like that, and then you can push all over their belly and it's like, okay, it's okay. When you examine, okay, so it's not just the abdominal exam, you need to think about other areas, okay? Lower abdominal pain. You probably, in a female, you probably need a pelvic exam, okay? Look for discharge, look for bleeding, do they have PID? A male, a GU exam, a testicular torsion, okay? My stomach is killing me. And they'll tell you nothing about their big red swollen testicle <laughs> until you go and you do the exam. Um, rectal, okay, so you can have a perirectal abscess, you can have a foreign body, okay, and it's, it's no joke, I think I have a picture here in a minute. Um, are they bleeding? Is there melanin? Okay, um, is there gross blood? CVA tenderness, examine their back. Is there bruising? Do they have tenderness or what's called Lloyd's punch? You have them set up and you punch their their flanks, um, and they and they have they have tenderness there. Okay, so right. This gentleman, X-ray does not let you take your coat in to X-ray. Okay, so this bottle was hidden. So this causes <laughs> abdominal pain, and it's real. This is not my patient. This is something I felt with the internet, but. I, I have pictures that I did not want to share. The, um, this happens, okay, so you have to have, you know, a good history. People are going to write all kinds of things on their triage notes to get back to a room, and they are on the computer and it says ankle pain, and you walk in and they go, I got a problem, Doc. <laughs> I got a problem. The first time you touch a stomach and it's vibrating is always interesting. Okay. <laughs> And it's happened. Okay, it's it's happened, and we go, oh, buddy, we got a problem. Yes, we do. Uh, what kind of batteries you got, man? This we gotta get the batteries dead. Okay, specific tests here. Okay, so so as um, we'll go to Murphy's later here because it's more for the gallbladder. So so as test for the uh, appendix, you have them lay on the left side. Okay. You, have them, you pull their right leg back, it will cause pain in their right lower quadrant because the psoas is going to irritate the appendix. That's not the easiest thing to do in the emergency department, so I do a cheater test, okay? You have them sit up in bed, you kind of lay them back. I put my hand on their thigh and say, raise your leg up against my hand. Push real hard, push real hard. It'll hurt, okay? That kicks in the psoas as well, so it works just as good, and the patient's not having to roll around and everything. Um, obturator sign. So you flex, the patient's lying so you, you flex their leg up and then you rotate it in and out. Again, same concept, it's going to irritate the appendix. Rothstein sign, so you palpate the left lower quadrant um, and it hurts on the right lower quadrant. Heel tap, you're just sitting in bed and you tap, tap the heel. Oh, it hurts there, yeah, it hurts. Again, or the other options, you have them jump up and down if you have a little kid. Uh, Murphy sign, so when you're palpating, the right upper quadrant, you're pushing in, they, they stop breathing in, okay? That's a positive Murphy sign for the gallbladder. So that's a picture of the psoas sign, they're laying on their left side, shows the psoas. All right, so we've gone through the history, we've gone through the physical, all right? So then we want past medical history to kind of give us maybe another indication. Ah, I've got diffuse, crampy abdominal pain, had my, I've had a colon resection, secondary colon cancer, I had a hysterectomy, I had my gallbladder out, okay? They're going to get scarring, they're going to get obstructions, okay? They'll get indication. 
AFib. I have pain everywhere. My stomach's, the stomach's pretty soft. But man, this is killing me. Someone with atrial fibrillation or undiagnosed atrial fibrillation is prone to mesenteric ischemia. Aortic aneurysm risk factors, high blood pressure, heart disease, alcohol abuse. Okay, I drink a 12 pack a day. I drink a fifth a day. Um, I'm vomiting. I got pain right here. Punch it towards pancreatitis. Peptic ulcers. Okay, um, steroids, anti-inflammatories, um, antibiotics can point you towards uh, colitis and things like that. C diff, diverticulitis. Okay. We're about halfway through, making good time here. Okay, so I, I was worried to this this person have abdominal pain. Okay. So, does anyone know what these things are? That's money. <laughs> we got money. We got money. Is this picture from Shawnee? So no, this is Southwest Integris. All right. So so I did my residency at Southwest Integris. Um, and uh, it's the gun and knife club, okay? It is lots of gangs, um, drop off shootings and stuff. So this gentleman who was shot in the abdomen. Um, we're sitting there at three in the morning and the ambulance door is locked. And this guy is smeared against the back window, a bloody mess, just with hell me. So we run out, everybody grabs him, okay? So who, who, what did we have? Identification was? Meth. Meth, okay? <laughs> So cocaine, so uncut cocaine, he's got powder cocaine, uh, two different kinds. As the police officer said, this is the people you give, this is the brown stuff you give to the people you don't like. <laughs> that's a real dirty meth. I mean, I don't know if there's a clean meth or whatever. And that's about $8,000 in cash. So, so he had it here in this little, one of those old leather bank cups. So we dragged this guy in and uh, put him in a room and you start, you know, trauma naked. Okay, you got a trauma patient, you get them butt naked, you start cutting up all their clothes. This guy's so high, I mean, he's falling asleep, he's got blood everywhere. So, um, we start cutting off his bridges. Um, yes, I use the word bridges. <laughs> um, the, uh, I'm on one side of the bed, the nurse standing on the other side, and uh, we're kind of getting, she kind of stops and bends over, hands that to me. <laughs> And the street officer said, call all the police you can. Get them here if someone's looking for that. Okay. The, uh, uh, so in about in Southwest Integris, in about five seconds you have 20 cops there. And we had an officer pretty much there all the time because this was you know, a pretty regular uh, occurrence. So get the guy all cleaned up. He's so messed up. He keeps just falling asleep and then he wake up. And just, Where's my mama? And I'm like, what? What's going on here? So he has a bullet hole right here. Okay? Bullet hole, he's got an exit wound right here. So we go check him out. We get a CAT scan. Uh, as many Southsiders do, I don't know if I should, they have a strong cockroach gene. Okay? They're indestructible. All right? they, can, they can survive a nuclear holocaust. He missed every organ and went through his soft tissue. So the bullet goes in here, tracks around his soft tissues, and comes out his back. Wow. Nothing. So, uh, so he got uh, a wound dressing. He got to go to jail. So the interesting thing is, is so the um, the two guys that bring him in. So you know these these guys drop him off. And these two guys are kind of standing there, and I was like, hey, get them because I told the security guard, grab them because who knows what's involved. Are like, hey, this guy walked up to other that's at a gas station. So all these cops come flooding in. They go, they go look for the car. And the story becomes true. So this guy shot himself. So he's sitting in his car. He's all messed up on drugs. And it looks like he shoots himself. He goes walking up to the 7-Eleven. And these two guys are sitting there. And this guy walks up covered in blood. They throw him in the back of their car. And they drive him to the emergency farm. They have no idea who he is. The thing that made it a little bit worse was that the gun in the car was a stolen police gun. <laughs> so he was in a little trouble. It's just another day in the ER. <laughs> okay, I figured I'd wake up a little bit. Um, so, so now we've done our history, we've done our physical, so now we got to start thinking about what we're going to check out, what we think is going on. So you go back to your anatomy. Like I said, you break it into the four quadrants, right down the middle. Okay, if it's right upper quadrant, you have the gallbladder, you have the liver, left upper quadrant, okay, the stomach, the spleen's not pictured, the pancreas, you see how it kind of lays all across the top. 
The appendix is in the right lower quadrant. Small intestine in the colon in the left lower quadrant, okay? Sigmoid colon, so like diverticulitis. Um, so you, when you approach the patient and you identify, you've got their history, it started suddenly, it hurts in my back, started two days ago, and now it's my right lower quadrant. Uh, when I eat, I get this pain here, and it's terrible right now. Okay, now you want to work it up. So here's a picture, this kind of what you'll see in the textbook, so breaking it down of the right, okay, so your right upper quadrant, gallstones, and ulcer, you see the ulcer kind of goes all across the top, it's kind of a, you know, boring, irritating, beer, uh, burning pain, pancreatitis, same thing there. Um, you know, your left upper quadrant, uh, they list all these things, kind of general stomach ulcer and things like that, is about the least concerning area. There's not a lot there. There's the spleen, um, but unless you've had some type of trauma, which goes back to, I was driving home last night, I worked yesterday out in Shawnee, and uh, one of my very first patients, so I thought was very good for this lecture, comes in, a 35 year old man, a 35 year old male by ambulance, complains, of, tells the paramedics, man, I hurt all over, I got body aches. I think I've had fevers, um, he calls in for body aches. So he comes in, and I said, well, what's going on, bud? He's kind of laying there, he was being kind of a jerk to the parent, he refused uh, an IV and stuff, but he wanted to take an ambulance. Uh, he's kind of being a jerk when he comes in and said, what's going on? He goes, man, my shoulders are killing me. Okay. He called the because your shoulders are killing me. And I just kind of hurt all over. When did it start? Yesterday morning I woke up, my shoulders are killing me. Um, you know, have you had fever? Yeah, I've had fevers. Well, uh, what do you mean by that? Well, when I get up and I walk, I break out into a sweat. Okay. Um, phone up? No, no. My stomach hurts today. My stomach hurts. Okay. Vomiting, diarrhea, nothing. All right. Yeah, medical problems. He's healthy. Except he likes to partake. Got a little bit of methamphetamines every once in a while. He actually, two months ago when I looked at his visits, he came in for an open arm fracture because he'd fallen off his bike while he was intoxicated on methamphetamines. So maybe he's a little accident prone. So, when you do an emergency department, if you're the old person, okay, Bad things go wrong with elderly, they get sick, okay, and fear the IV drug user. They're equivalent to a 150-year-old, okay? The 22-year-old that has a heart attack is a drug user, okay? Uh, you know, kidney failure, endocarditis, I mean, they, they just have bad things going on. Fear them. So, you get a big workup. Blood cultures and everything are right. They're injecting needles into their, uh, into their veins so they get back to remix. So, this guy had an abscess or something like that, I'm working him up. So he comes back from CAT scan, I ask CAT scan the stomach, because so when I push on his stomach, he just jumps off the bed. And I'm like, okay, okay, well, we'll, we'll work you out. So the x-ray tech comes to me and goes, hey, you may want to look at his x-ray. I think he's got a bunch of fluid in there or something like that. So I peek at it, and, um, and there's a bunch of blood around his liver and his spleen. And it looks like there's a spleen line. And the other thing in my back of my mind was like, this guy has like a spleen abscess. IV drugs, you get endocarditis, and you get bacteremic, and you get abscesses everywhere. You have that. So radiologist, so I go back in the room, I said, hey, have you fallen at all? His legs were kind of all bruised up, I noticed, when he got there. Little, little, like, like a two-year-old kid running around hitting their shins. Okay, little bruises and stuff. Um, have you fallen at all? No, not that I know of. And I was like, I look, I said, sit up here. So I'm looking around his back and everything a little bit better, and I see no bruising. Um, he's got one little sore, but it looks like he's been picking out a, a tattoo or something he's got on his back. I'm like, okay. Um, so Ray always called me and goes, hey, he's got a big spleen like his belly's full of blood. Okay. So I go back in the room, I'm like, man, you have a spleen laceration. Have you fallen? Not that I know of. I said, okay. You fell about two months ago on a bike. Do you black out sometimes? <laughs> oh, yeah. I get high on meth, I black out, I fall, I don't know what. So the guy had probably fallen a couple days ago, ruptured his spleen, he has no idea. So he gets put in the hospital for surgery to, to deal with. So, um, But interesting again, that's your classic example of my shoulders hurt. Okay, That's called Kerr sign, K-E-H-R. Okay, You see it with spleen, you see it with the gallbladder, it's radiation to the shoulders or classically to the scapula. Okay. It's because that blood, blood in your abdomen is irritating. Any fluid in your abdomen, I don't know, very insist ruptures, and there's fluid in your abdomen, it's just uncomfortable. It's not supposed to be there. Um, so it irritates the diaphragm, causing the shoulders to hurt. And so that's what this guy had. So anyways, for this lecture, I thought it was kind of an interesting case. 
So let's figure out our, our workup. Okay, an EKG. And an older person with upper abdominal pain, an EKG 100% of the time. Okay? Females, classically, their chest pain does not, is not classic. Okay? Females do not follow rules. Okay. You guys are all over the place. You're complicated. You can't figure it out. Okay? So, but get an EKG. An EKG is a cheap test. It's an easy test. It takes six seconds of text run, runs in the room. It's an EKG, you have it, you just rule out a heart attack. Very simple to do, okay? For upper abdominal pain. The lower abdominal pain, you don't need that. A CVC, and I put overutilized, okay? Don't put your decision on a CVC. A white count does not tell you whether or not there's an infection or, or not. A white count is a, and maybe going against all your other professors, but um, in the emergency department, okay? A white count has no decision making for me. It's a stress reactant. A person that has a heart attack, they don't have an infection, they'll have a 20,000 white count. Because a white count is a stress reactant. Okay? Cancer. They may not be sick, but or they have sick, they have cancer, but they have elevated white count for their treatment, they may have a low white count. Don't put your money into, well, they don't have a white count, they don't have appendicitis. 30% of appendicitis will have a normal white count, okay? I got into an argument with my surgeon about this two months ago. Well, what's their white count? Well, you know, it, it, it's normal. This can't be appendicitis. Why not? The CT's got an inflamed appendix. Who cares what the white count is? Well, why do you order it? Because that's the first question you ask, is what I told them. It's not for me, it's for them. The patient clinically has right lower quadrant pain. On CT, they have appendicitis. They need surgery. I could care less about the white count. Okay. But, okay, you want to get a CBC, you want to get the white count, you want to look at their hemoglobin, right? If they're bleeding, all right, are they anemic, platelets, they have some type of spleen issue, they have thrombocytopenia. So 30% of nonspecific abdominal pain in this study they did, looked at 3,000 patients, their white count was elevated. Workup was totally benign. So don't put all your money on an elevated white count. Chemistry, okay, look at kidney function, you want to capture the liver function, a CMP, lipase for upper abdominal pain, urinalysis, urine pregnancy. Urine pregnancy, you'll get to this, okay, um, in your gyne section. Do not miss an ectopic pregnancy, okay. A female from the age of 10 till they've had a hysterectomy or they're in menopause is pregnant until proven otherwise. If their pregnancy is positive and they have pain, they're in a topic until proven otherwise. That is a, a, a diagnosis you cannot miss. Okay, because it's, it's non-defendable. All right. You, that patient goes home, it ruptures, they bleed out their abdomen, they die. You, it, not, not much is going to stand up in court. An abdominal series. An abdominal series, okay, is ordered a lot. PAs, mid-levels love the abdominal series. I order one a year, if that, okay? For me, there's not a lot of, here, here's where the abdominal series, I say, comes in handy. You have a patient with a history of small bowel obstruction, okay? This feels the same way, I'm distended. You don't want to do a CT. You can do a, a acute abdominal series and that confirm it, they get put in the hospital. A foreign body or free air, okay? The patient is too uncomfortable or too sick to go to CAT scan, you can do an acute abdominal series in the in the department. See free air. You're done. You know because you don't want to see send a uh, unstable patient to, to CAT scan. CT obviously that's kind of the gold standard basically now um, because it in, it can captures everything. You know three dimensional picture of everything. You get all the organs. Then ultrasound depending on um, your capability is the best test for the gallbladder. Okay, let's get going here. Run them on here. Um, so let's go through some specific things I think about. So I've got my history, I've got my physical, they've got right lower quadrant pain. Okay, so I'm going to work them up. I'm going to get a CBC, a chemistry, a urine, um, and then a CT. So appendicitis is obstruction of the lumen, uh, okay, from lymphoid hyperplasia. Okay, you get a narrowing just from lymphoid tissue, uh, food. An appendicolith can obstruct it. 
So you get that dilation, that visceral pain, and then it becomes inflamed, it starts infarcting, you get some inflammation, you get the more of the um, uh, parietal pain, moving to the right lower quadrant. Classically, it's the paraumbilical pain, then it migrates to the right lower quadrant. Um, patients associated symptoms will have anorexia. Okay, what's anorexia? Okay, right. Loss of appetite. It's a very good indicator. Patient comes in at 3 o'clock. I got pain down here. Did you eat today? No. Well, why? I just wasn't hungry for some reason. They won't be hungry. Um, nausea, vomiting, fevers. We talked about the clinical signs. The clinical signs, you get a CT and it confirms it. Okay, preferably with IV contrast. Um, maybe in an outpatient setting and you have more time, they encourage oral. The more contrast you give to a radiologist, the better. If a radiologist could have it their way, they'd have IV, oral, and rectal contrast in every patient. But the problem with oral contrast is when I'm seeing 150 patients in an emergency department, is they drink it and you wait two hours because it has to pass. The literature really says, new literature really says, a CT abdomen pelvis without contrast, if you have a good radiologist, should be adequate. I prefer with contrast because it delineates things a little bit better, makes it the radiologist's life a little bit easier, so I'm willing to give a little bit. Ultrasound, if you can limit um, radiation, you know, obviously with pregnancy. Uh, I had a recent um, six months pregnant girl come in and had been having pain for about three weeks. I did the bedside ultrasound to look at the baby and then there's, this, there's something over here. There's just, so I uh, get an ultrasound because we want to, um, Avoid it, she's kind of fevers and pain. She's seen a bunch of different facilities and people just said, oh, you have pregnancy. She had a big abscess there. She had appendicitis for like three weeks. I ended up CTing her because um, my surgeon, and you have to sit down, it, it's okay. You just need a you know, radiologist, the literature approves it. You need to sit down and have the conversation of, hey, I'm concerned um, that you may have appendicitis. And really, my surgeon's not going to do anything until I get a CAT scan. Baby's going to have exposure, you're past the first trimester, it should be okay. And you document that. Document that discussion that the patient agreed. Okay? But for children especially, where I've seen ultrasound beneficial is the child that goes, I hurt right here. If they can do that, do right here, an ultrasound will be good enough. It also depends on your sonographer. So I will usually have a conversation with whatever ultrasound technician is on. Hey, are you comfortable with, um, you know, an ultrasound? Children's does them all the time. So their technicians are very comfortable. If they're not and the family does not want a CT, I'll transfer them to children's. So final disposition, you start some antibiotics, you call surgery and they go to surgery. Get their appendix taken out. Okay, so normal appendix. So the thing to look at, okay, look at, so here's the appendix right here. It's got some air in it, and that's not uncommon. So if you look, it's kind of clearly delineated. Your guys' picture may be a little pixely because the screen's so big, but it's just kind of smooth, right? It's not inflamed. So here, okay, they've got an appendicle lift. This is this big calcification, but you see all this stranding around it. It just looks angry. That's inflammation and it's enlarged, okay? So that's what it looks like on CT. All right, gallbladder disease. So caused by gallstones or eight calculus cholecystitis. So, you know, the gallbladder is a bag that helps you digest foods. Okay, if it has a big stone there obstructing and it's a muscle. Okay, so if it's got a gallbladder or a gallstone that's obstructing it, it hurts. So the pain is classically postprandial. They're going to eat about 30, 45 minutes later. Oh, I have this severe pain. Okay. The other side is a calculus cholecystitis. So they don't have gallstones, but the gallbladder has stopped working. Okay. So and that is seen in a HIDA scan, which is not an emergency department test. Um, it's a nuclear medicine test. They give them a dye, and they see how the heart, or the heart, the um, gallbladder contracts, and they actually measure an ejection fraction. So right upper quadrant pain, okay, it can be, it can be epigastric, it's crampy, it can radiate to the back, it can radiate to the shoulder, um, they have associated fevers, chills, okay, that gets more concerning for inflammation of cholecystitis, but you can just have biliary colic, you can have gallstones, you can have pain, and it advances to cholecystitis when that gallbladder gets inflamed. 
Um, so they're going to have fevers, chills, um, positive Murphy signs. So when you push in, they stop breathing. Um, Charcot's triad. This is kind of a big surgery thing. Fever, jaundice, right upper quadrant pain. So they're going to have fever, jaundice, their bilirubin, their liver functions on the CMP will be elevated. Right upper quadrant pain. That's an indication of acute cholecystitis. It can progress to ascending cholangitis. Pretty rare. I've seen about a handful of cases, and these people are sick. These people are septic. They're confused. I mean, they're they are not going to do well. Um, they are, the cases I've had, they are extremely uh, jaundiced, very high bilirubins, so hypotension, ultramental status, you're getting into the sepsis realm um, because they've got an infection of their biliary system that's affected their whole body. So treatments, okay, fluids, pain control. Um, if uh, this talks about using an anticholinergic like Benadryl to help maybe relax the muscles, um, so it depends. So disposition is different here. Um, gallbladders are not emergent anymore. So, and people get very mad about this because they get a diagnosis of gallstones <coughs> at the primary care physician's office, and the primary care says, "Hey, if this happens, you can go to the ER. They'll take it out." Well, now, unfortunately, we don't. If you don't have fever, your liver functions aren't elevated, um, you don't have acute inflammation on your ultrasound. It's, alpha, it's pain control, and you get to go see a surgeon in the next week and hopefully they'll take it out. Acute cholecystitis, the same cholangitis, obviously those are people, those are more sick. Antibiotics, admission, fluids, pain control, and they need to see a surgeon. Peptic ulcer disease, common causes H. pylori. NSAIDs, okay, this is going to be a burning, okay, burning pain. Um, it can be better with food or worse with food, depending on if it's a duodenal or peptic ulcer. Um, nausea, vomiting, obviously concerning for melanin, bright red blood. You need to quantify the blood, okay? So you have somebody that comes in and says, yeah, I, I, I threw up blood, okay? How much blood? Could you fill up a solo cup? Was it just streaked? No, there was just a couple of specks. Okay, well, that's not that concerning. Um, I've been having melanin. Black stools for the last three days, and then I vomited today. I filled the toilet with blood. Um, that's a little more concerning, right? So the ulcer's been bleeding, the digestive turns black, but then it starts bleeding acutely, and they throw up a bunch of blood. So you want to get your lab work, see if they're anemic, okay? If there's a sudden change, so this, so a peptic ulcer should not technically be, be very tender. They're going to have some pain. There's significantly tender complications are perforation, so. Uh, Peptic ulcer, duodenal ulcer can perforate. Um, so surgeons will go in and um, do a partial gastrectomy. The treatment's ultimately a PPI. So the people that, eh, I took some blood streaks. Um, their lab work's okay, their belly's benign. I'll send them home on protonics or Nexium. Um, you obviously want to stop the anti-inflammatories. NG tube, um, endoscopy, okay, if there's no perforation, uh, they can inject epinephrine, they can do ablations and things with endoscopy. Bowel obstruction, so this is your uh, visceral pain, small bowel dilates, kind of diffuse crampy pain. Um, they've never had it before and have had a bunch of surgeries, I would recommend doing a CT, okay? Obviously, like I said, um, radiologists would like oral. Um, I typically don't because they're typically vomiting and you give them oral contrast, they vomit, you don't want them to aspirate. Um, barium pneumonitis is a very, very terrible thing. Um, and so this different treatments, okay? So small bowel most common cause of adhesions from previous surgeries. The 45-year-old that's never had a surgery and comes in and has a large bowel obstruction, it's not a fun conversation because you're probably going to go in and say, you got a big tumor there that's blocking things. They get put in, and they've got to have surgery to remove that mass. <coughs> So, again, so we discussed the acute abdominal series, okay, with small bowel obstruction. So here's your, be aware of what you're ordering. So you get an eight-piece uh, supine view, upright abdomen, and uh, a chest home with it. So here's your classic um, upright abdomen um, with the air fluid levels or step ladder. Uh, you can see the, the, the fluid levels, the kind of the cutoffs and all the difference. And that's indicative of a bowel obstruction. 
So diverticulitis, okay, diverticulosis is common. We all get them, but when they become inflamed, they become diverticulitis. Acute inflammation of the diverticulum and surrounding tissue. Uh, the idea of kind of it's unclear what causes it, if it's an obstruction or poor motility, uh, but the classic is uh, left lower quadrant pain. So this is kind of your opposite of your appendix. Left lower quadrant pain, bloody diarrhea is the classic. I'll tell you about 50% of the time um, I see constipation anymore. So I've been constipated and I've had this pain and I'll have diverticulitis. Um, Nausea, vomiting, fevers. So you want to get your lab, you get your CAT scan to confirm it. In this situation, acute abdominal series is little help because you can't see the inflammation. So if they're non-toxic, they're not fevers, they're not vomiting, they say, I got some pain right here. You get a CAT scan, there's no perforation. You can discharge them with oral antibiotics, some pain medicine, some nausea medicine, Cipro and Flagyl. You want to cover for anaerobes with uh, Flagyl. Um, and, and they can, you know, do about 10 days of treatment there. Obviously, if they're vomiting, febrile, septic, volume depleted, these people need to be admitted for IV antibiotics. Complications with that um, are perforation or abscess. So that's another big reason why you want to do a CT if someone has not been worked up for this, because they can get micro perforations and leak. Um, now they will treat those with antibiotic for a few days as long as they're getting better. Uh, they'll just medically manage it, but they continue to get worse, they'll go in and remove the portion of the colon. So here is a picture of diverticulitis. So you see the colon, you can see the actual diverticuli. So again, so you see how the mesentery here is kind of nice pixelated, and you see how it's hazy? That's inflammation. So this bowel here, okay, is a nice smooth edge. This just looks angry and inflamed. Uh, and real quick, in a susception, this is more of a pediatric disease, three months to six years. I, I'm following you, so don't feel rushed. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm, okay. I'm going to give them a lecture, so. Okay, perfect. Okay. All right. Now you're stuck. <laughs> Anybody need to stand up and stretch or anything? <laughs> uh, three months to six years is the classic. I've seen it in adults, okay? It's a telescoping of the colon, so it actually... You know, if you're able to take a tube and put it inside the other tube, it folds up on itself. Okay, that's the interception. Male over female, four to one. He not HSP, he not shown purpura. Okay, so that's a small uh, vessel vasculitis, a rash on the back of the legs. Kids with that there's an association with. So these kids are very kind of colicky. They will hurt off and on is the big indication, and this is a kind of a history and physical diagnosis. Okay, parents come in and say, he'll just ball up and scream and then it suddenly stops. And then ball up and scream and then it suddenly stops. That's concerning for an interception because it's kind of telescoping on itself. So you have to have a high clinical suspicion because you're going to transfer them somewhere that will do air enemas. Um, at my facility, I'd have to transfer them to children's because my facility wouldn't do this. So it's a big, big deal. Uh, bloody, the board question would be current jelly stool, a bloody stool, it's a late finding, um, and then we kind of discuss the, pre we discuss the presentation. Pancreatitis, okay, two most common causes in the <coughs> United States is alcohol abuse and gallstones. So severe pain, vomiting, this is the person, you know, you'll see repeats. Uh, the person, and in this range is from 20 to 50, 60. 12 pack a day, uh, fifth a day, drinker, and they come and they start vomiting. This should be always a clinical suspicion. The pain classical will radiate to the back, nausea vomiting with it, can be fevers. These people can be super sick. You can have a mild patient that's sitting there vomiting and say I have a bunch of pain, but they can become overwhelming sepsis. I've seen some of the worst cases with pancreatitis of sepsis, multi-organ failure in young people, 30-year-olds. Um, drinking a bottle of vodka a day is poisoning yourself. Okay, so you guys don't do it. 
Branson criteria doesn't have um, a lot of weight in the emergency department. Um, these are indications of more severe disease and increased mortality. Uh, it, it can be on the board sometimes. Glucose over 200, age over 55, your LDH, your AST, and your white blood cell count. Um, so they look at those, and actually you can repeat them in 48 hours and compare, and it can give you an indication of mortality. Treatments, keep them MPO. Uh, fluids and pain medication, control the pain. They've been vomiting, so you want to rehydrate them. And you basically let the pancreas rest, okay? So but you keep them MPO, nothing to eat or drink. And that's really the treatment. They go in the hospital, they don't eat or drink anything for 24 hours. You start them on ice chips for 24 hours, then you have them sip a little bit, then advance their diet in the hospital for a couple days, basically take away their toxin. Gallstones can cause it. Uh, I just had a 75-year-old lady come in, super sweet, was like, oh, I had a little bit of pain this morning. She's sitting there and we're laughing and everything. Um, she's talking about her husband needs to mow the yard, who's like 85, and I'm like, what? <laughs> and uh, she's like, we gotta get home, he gotta mow the yard. And she's like, Hold on, let me check you out. So she's been told, she's like, about a year, this is my gallstones. About a year ago, I was told I had some gallstones. Well, her, I'm going to check some lab work. I'm figuring it's going to be normal, and she's going to follow up outpatient. Well, her liver function's come back elevated. Her bilirubin was three, almost once. Um, and her lipase has taken forever. She had vomited once. Um, and I call the lab, and they go, hey, we're having to dilute it down. That's never a good indication. So less than 300 is normal. Hers was 17,000. Oh, wow. um, so, you get an ultrasound of her gallbladder, she's got multiple tiny stones. What happens is the stone passes into the ducts, causes an obstruction that causes back up into the pancreas, causes inflammation, causes pain, vomiting. She was very not sick when I saw her. Probably the stone had then fallen into the small bowel. So she's more comfortable, the pain's relieved. Um, she still gets put in the hospital for treatment and further evaluation. With the elevated bilirubin, you need to then put them in to get an MRCP. Okay, an MRI, basically, of the biliary system because you want to make sure that obstruction is gone. Then, if that obstruction is gone, you talk with your surgeon about whether the gallbladder needs to come out now, get her through the pancreatitis, and then surgery at a later point. Mesenteric ischemia, okay, this is a terrible diagnosis. Um, it's difficult to find sometimes. So, ischemia of the Superior mesenteric artery is the most common, okay? A predisposing factor is AFib. Uh, someone either has AFib and because of risk factors are not anticoagulated, or a person that's undiagnosed with AFib. Someone that comes with kind of diffuse cranky abdominal pain, you notice their heart rate's fast, it's a little bit irregular, you get an EKG, they got AFib. In the back of your mind, you need to start thinking, okay, could this patient have mesenteric ischemia? Right, same thing as strokes, AFib predisposes you to strokes because it forms a clot in your right atrium. Your atriums don't beat effectively because they're just sitting there fluttering and you form a clot. That clot then falls out of the heart and goes either into the brain, get a stroke, or it can go down into your um, mesentery arteries, cause an obstruction. Same thing as a heart attack as well, you can get atherosclerosis, cause an acute obstruction of that artery, so they get this diffuse, crampy pain, Gradual onset because they're starting to get a little bit of ischemia and then the tissue starts dying and the pain becomes severe. Uh, they can't really localize because it's all over. Um, and these people are sick. Okay, uh, low blood pressure, sepsis because they have dying tissue in their abdominal cavity. Uh, so you need to do a CT8 of the abdomen and really surgery. Okay, they need to have that tissue removed. But they're just going to continue to get sicker and sicker. Um, so here's a picture of, so the classic is pneumatosis intestinalis. Uh, so you get air, that the bowel starts dying, and when things die, they form gas. So you get air in the wall of the bowel. This person also has air in their biliary system, uh, and they're mesentery, and so that's never a good finding. <coughs> Abdominal aortic aneurysm, okay. So predisposed connective tissue disorders, Marfan syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos, uh, family history, there's about a 16% association with family members that have previous um, 
aortic, or aortic aneurysms, hypertension, heart disease, or predisposing factors. So, not to be confused with a dissection. Aortic aneurysm and a dissection are very two, and I see frequent confusion in that. Okay. And aortic dissection, the aorta is going to be the normal size. It's a tearing of the artery. Aortic aneurysm is enlargement of the aorta. Hypertension, just the constant beating on your aorta, causes it to stretch. They'll present with abdominal pain, flank pain. Um, so this is where ultrasound has become incredibly valuable in the emergency department. Bedside ultrasound by providers. So I have a $50,000 Philips ultrasound in my emergency department. I use it probably 10 times a day. See 30 to 40 patients a day. I use it on a quarter of them. Whether they look at a baby, look at aorta. If I've got a gentleman over the age of 50 with back pain, I go in, I run it down their aorta, make sure there's not an aneurysm, I'm done. You know, they've got much of skeletal back pain, but I've ruled out aortic aneurysm. Um, so emergency department, so if the patient's unstable, I, so they'll present, um, the patient says, oh, I had this severe pain and I passed out, so I have syncope. Um, abdominal bruit, little blood pressure, severe pain radiates to their back. Um, the uh, you bedside ultrasound, if they're unstable, bedside ultrasound, if they have the classic symptoms, you're on the phone with your cardiothoracic surgeon within minutes. CT admin and pelvis will confirm. Um, and it talks about not missing the elderly person. Uh, the other thing I, I, meant, I thought about on mesenteric ischemia, these people again will kind of have soft bellies, so this is that pain out of proportion. So you kind of have an elderly person, you give them morphine. Okay, you give them four milligrams, five milligrams, they continue to hurt. So then you give them 10 milligrams, they still hurt. 20 milligrams, 30 milligrams, 40 milligrams, a mass amount, you can't get their pain under control. You need to kind of think about that in the back of your mind. So that's pain out of proportion to the exam. Because the exam could be pretty soft, kind of non-specific, but their pain is not controllable. So you'll find these, so you're working up a kidney stone or something, and you find a three centimeter aneurysm, not ruptured. It's not emergent, they need follow-up. You need to make sure you document and discuss that with the patient. You don't want to, a, a, a um, frequent cause of, of medical malpractice is delayed diagnosis, okay? So when you do a test and you have all these incidental findings, you need to make sure you discuss that with the patient. So you have a patient that comes in and you work them up for something else, their appendix or something, they have appendicitis, but they have a three and a half centimeter air aneurysm. You need to, um, tell them about that, and I mean, I will send them home with discharge paperwork if they're going home or many, with information on abdominal aortic aneurysm because they need to get routine ultrasounds and monitor this. When they get over five centimeters, is the classic finding, they're at risk for a rupture. Anymore, so used to they go in and they do open surgery, they do endograft gra graf grafts so easily now, they slide a graft right in and fix them, non-invasive, it's just like a, a angiogram, um, so they're super easy to fix if you catch them early. Once that have ruptured, okay, stabilization fluids, um, because you don't want to induce hypertension or volume overload. The concern is that you uh, can worsen the bleeding, worsen the aneurysm. So there's kind of some controversy of how much fluids. Permissive hypotension is, is kind of the new idea, allowing their blood pressure to be 90 to 100. 50% of these patients will die in surgery. Um, in my experience, it's probably really more than that. Um, this is a terrible disease. There's a lot of people you see that know they have them. Um, they've been deemed non-surgical, and they'll tell you, I'm waiting for the pop, and I'm going to die. They know. It's pretty crazy. Um, I've had patients sitting there. Patients know. They'll, they'll sit there, and they come in for bone pain. They'll look right at you, and go, it popped. Other surviving hearts. So, very difficult because you're messing with the vasculature, okay? So, they'll get renal infarctions and things like that, uh, or, or redu reduction of blood flow to the kidney, so they'll develop kidney failure, liver failure. So, here's a non ruptured aneurysm, okay? That's pretty big. 
So here's the contrast going through, okay? So it's not ruptured. This is pretty big. This is probably about eight centimeters. This patient needs pretty close follow-up. This is a patient that if I incidentally see this, they're going to call to a cardiac pressure surgeon like, hey, can you see this patient pretty quick? It's not emergent. They don't have to see him. You need to let the patient know about it, okay? This is not good. So you have contrast in the aneurysm, all right? You have blood and contrast spilling out into the abdomen. This person is sick. Okay. So those kind of things. Other things to think about, obviously, um, outside of kind of the GI and the vascular, that I'm not going to go over uh, ectopic pregnancy, ovarian torsions, tubal ovarian abscesses, PID, testicular torsions, kidney stones, all those things will cause abdominal pain. Um, so there's just something to think about. So basically the general treatment, okay, fluids, pain relief, you want the patient to be comfortable. A lot of the literature will say, well, don't give them pain meds until, until you, know, you, can get a, you don't want to dull their exam for the surgeon. Who cares? If they're in pain, make them feel better. Antibiotics if they need it, keep them NPO until you figure out if it's surgical or not. NPO if it's pancreatitis for treatment, NG2, plus or minus if they need it. So disposition, right? So when they come in my emergency department to see me, they, I have to make the decision of whether they're going home or not. So do I need to go, they need to go to surgery, can they go home, follow up. Um, children or even you know adults, right lower quadrant pain, it started this morning. Always have the discussion of this could be early, you get a normal CAT scan, this could be early appendicitis because it's missed sometimes. If the symptoms progress, come back in 24 hours. You'll develop fever, vomiting, the pain will not get better. That's a good indication of it's not appendicitis. If they say, oh, I've had pain for a couple days, it'll go away, it'll come back, it'll go away. Appendicitis will not go away, it'll just progress and it'll become sicker and sicker. All right? My kids. This is uh, it's Robbers Cave on the left in Oklahoma, down by Lake Impala. Uh and this was a uh, Camelback in um, uh, in Scottsdale. We did this, both these uh, fall. The 11-year-old is pretty pissed <laughs> on the top of Camelback. It was a little more challenging than uh, I expected. It, it's a mountain climb, but it, it's really needed for the opportunity. To do it. So. Michael not. He was pissed because we had to go back down, and the down part was my goofy eight-year-old is just like jumping down rocks. Oh my god! My wife didn't go up because she would run the half marathon, and so um, she didn't want to get hurt. And I was like, "Thank God!" Because watching my eight-year-old bounce down these boulders, I was like, "He is gonna fall." You always see the future fracture. Oh my god. Okay, guys, I went a little bit long. What questions do you have about anything? Emergency department, anything? Um, otherwise, I answer it all. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you. It takes like five minutes, like quick, and I'll get started.